Stir up, we beseech thee, O Lord, the wills of thy people, that they may plenteously bring forth good fruit, and may be plenteously rewarded by thee, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, we're continuing on the Holy Trinity in this classical, classical one. Uh, set to the tune of Manchester. O God, we praise thee and confess that thou, the only Lord and everlasting Father, art by all earth adored. Now turn our attention to Reverend William Good, The Divine Rule, Faith and Practice, three volumes. Uh, this, this is a real classic. Uh, I found this part from seminary years at, later, maybe decades later, and it was just an absolute gem. Real scholar, clear writer, old prayer book man. <clears throat> we got a preface here published in the 1842 edition. He would have been 41 in at this point. The movement that has late and lately taken place under the auspices of the authors of the tracts of our time, whatever view may be taken of it, must be admitted to one of a very important kind, whether for evil or for good. The degree of development it has already attained amply shows that its success must be intended with a great and thorough change in the principles and practices of our church in various important points. That such would be the case <clears throat> was for a long time studi studiously concealed from public view. So much caution indeed was exercised in the earlier part of their career by the Tractarians that to none but those who were somewhat acquainted with the controversial writings of divines on points touched upon, upon so as to see full force and tendency of the terms used, was it apparent whether, whether it was going. Though to such, I may add, it was abundantly evident that the first intimation of it to the public mind was in the very seasonable publication of, of Mr. Froud's Remains, a work which most clearly and opportunely revealed the real spirit and views to use Mr. Froud's own term, conspirators against the present order of things in our church. <coughs> As time has advanced and the number of its adherents increased, the reserve formally practiced has been gradually thrown aside. Perhaps indeed their own views have become more fixed and definite than when they commenced their labors and we are far from laying to their charge any other concealment than such as they judged to be wise and prudent for the inculcation of new and unpalatable truths, though, they may, though we may be observed for pardon for observing that a more open course appears to us, to use a mild term, much freer from objection, objections. It is now then openly avowed that the articles, though it is notorious that they were drawn up by Protestants, this is a quote, and intended for the Protestant establishment of Protestantism, are not to be interpreted according to the known opinions of their framers, but in what the Tractarians are pleased to call a Catholic sense. So it's historically illegitimate to interpret the formularies in the articles contrary to the authors. It's an act of dishonesty to come in and interpret them in another way. If you don't like those articles, then rewrite them on your way, Johnny boy. I'm talking about Newman. His carcass is rotting. And, and they did use the reserve in secrecy. <clears throat> when which interpretation we are informed was intended to be admissible, though not that which the authors took themselves 
in order to comprehend those who did not go as far in Protestantism as themselves. He's quoting. Though the articles are said in the very title prefixed to them to have been drawn up, the avoiding of controversies and diversities of opinion, and for the establishing of consent touching true religion, and were put in forth in compliance with the crest request of the lower house of convocation that certain principles, articles containing the principal grounds of the Christian religion be set forth as well as to determine the truth of things this day in controversy as to show what errors are chiefly to be eschewed. And the declaration prefixed to the articles requiring them to be interpreted in the literal and grammatical sense sanctions such a mode of interpretation. This, that is, the literal and grammatical sense comprehends the uncatholic and Protestant doctrine against which the tractators protest, and also that opposite Catholic doctrine, we would say Romanist doctrine which they embrace and this catholic doctrine which they embrace is such as is consistent with the decrees of the council of trent and the declaration forbidding any person to affix any new sense to the articles promulgated we are told at a time when the leading men of our church were especially noted for catholic views but surely if the literal and grammatical sense of the articles comprehends so much as the tractators suppose, and men had all along subscribed the articles with propriety, though varying in their sentiments from the Protestantism of Bishop Jewell to the Catholicism which squared with the decrees of the Council of Trent, it was rather a useless admonition for the wit of man could hardly devise a sense of the articles not to be found within such an extensive range as this. The very men, be it observed, <clears throat> who say that these articles are carefully drawn up for the establishment of Protestantism. And we want to kind of get at the homilies here too. The homilies on salvation, for example. And the very men, be it observed, who say that these articles, carefully drawn up for the establishment of Protestantism, will bear meanings ranging from Protestantism to anti-Protestantism that agrees with the decisions of the Council of Trent, tell us that in the writings of the Fathers, a representation of the Orthodox faith is to be found so clearly and definitively delivered in the consentient testimony of all of them, that so far from being, there being any uncertainty as to their meaning, the Orthodox faith as thus delivered is an obvious historical fact from which flows the convenient consequence that he who follows it has all the benefit of infallibility incurring the odium of claiming it. Moreover, to talk of the blessings of emancipation from the papal yoke is to use a phrase of a bold and undutiful tenor. To call the earlier reform martyrs is to beg the question, which of course Protestants do not consider a question, but which no one pretending to the name of Catholic can for a moment think of conceding to them whether if that for which these persons suffered were for the truth. But Protestantism in its essence and in all its bearings, it's characteristically the religion of corrupt human nature. The Protestant tone of doctrine and thought is essentially anti-Christian. The reader will observe that the term used <clears throat> in these denunciations is no longer as it was at first ultra-Protestantism, but with a candor which we should have been glad to have seen from the commencement, Protestantism. The present feelings and objects of the tractators have been clearly set forth by themselves in the following words. By clinging to the authority of these reformers as individuals, 
they say, are not we are we not dealing unfairly both with the Protestants and other branches of the Catholic Church? Are we not holding out false colors to the former and drawing them near us only in the end to be alienated from us more completely than ever? On the other hand, are we not cutting ourselves off from the latter by making common cause with a set of writers with whom in such measure as we have imbibed the true Catholic spirit, we can have no sort of sympathy Meanwhile, to the unprejudiced inquirers after truth, are we not, until we have shaken off all such auxiliaries as these, exhibiting a very distorted and unreal representation of the Catholicism to which we desire to attract them, holding before them a phantom which will elude their grasp, a light which will cheat their pursuit, on settling their early prepossessions without affording a complete and satisfactory equivalent, disquieting them in their present home without furnishing them even a shelter, this should be well considered. It ought not to be for nothing, no, nor for anything short of the very vital truth, some truth not to be rejected with, without fatal error, or embraced without radical change, that persons of name and influence should venture upon the part of ecclesiastical agitators, intrude upon the peace of the contented, and raise doubts in the minds of the uncomplaining. All this has been done. All this is worth hazarding in a matter of life and death. Much of it is predicted as the characteristic result, therefore the sure criterion of the truth. An object thus momentous we believe to be the unprotestantizing, to use an offensible but forcible word, of the national church. And accordingly we are ready to endure, however we may lament, the undeniable and in themselves disastrous effects of the pending controversy. We cannot stand where we are. We must go backwards and forwards, and it will surely be the latter. It is absolutely necessary towards the consistency of the system which certain parties are laboring to restore that truths should be clearly stated, which as yet have been but in intimated, and others <coughs> develop which are now in but germ, and as we go on, we must recede more and more from the principles, if any such there be, of the English Reformation. Such is the language now held by the tractators in their orange, in their organ, the British critic. Now, if by we in this passage they mean themselves, it is only what all who really understood their principles foresaw from the commencement of their career. But if by we they mean the English church, then we trust that they will find that there is much difference between the temporary impression produced by taking men by surprise under false colors and that which is made by the power of truth accompanied by the blessing of God that the English church is to go forwards with the tractators into all the false doctrines and mummeries of popery now openly advocated by them, even to the primary false principle that the church ought to assume the appearance of one great spiritual monarchy with the Pope at the head of it is, we trust, a prediction that has little probability of being realized. It is, if possible, still more painful to contemplate the fact that these remarks were published by those who profess the highest possible regard for the authority of their spiritual rulers. And not long ago, after one of the heads of the party head, with many professions of submission to the wishes of his diocesan, consented to close the series of the tracts for the times. 
Well, he is here identified with ecclesiastical agitators ready to use every effort, <clears throat> brave every difficulty, and throw the church into confusion to the setting of father against son and mother against daughter for the purpose of effecting the design of unprotestantizing the church. Such is the practical influence of their inordinate views of church authority. We have a footnote here from the British critic. Of course, union of the whole church under one visible government is abstractedly the most perfect state. We were so united, and now we are not. And the history of this great struggle for religious independence is, in any case, the record and origin of the origin and progress of that deplorable schism. We talk of the blessings of emancipation from the papal yoke and use other phrases of a like bold and undutiful tenor. I want to go back to Rome. Really? The reader will observe that in their use of the word Catholic, the tractators are directly opposed to our reformers. Our reformers were so far from, from thinking that Protestantism and Catholicism were opposed to each other, that one ground for supporting the former was their conviction that, that the tight, that best deserved the title of the latter. Bishop Jewell believed that it was the Reformation restored the ancient religion to our church. And both he and I, I believe I may say, all the more learned reformers claimed the name Catholic as belonging more peculiarly to themselves and to, and to those who in both the Western and Eastern churches had corrupted the pure faith and worship of the primitive church. The tractators, therefore, like the Romanists, are at issue with the reformers as to what is Catholicism and the ancient religion. This the reader ought carefully to bear in mind, lest he be deceived as too many suffer themselves to be by words and phrases. And the same caution must be given to the tractators' repudiation of the charge of holding Roman tenets. Their repudiation of it is grounded merely upon their rejection of certain more gross impositions and practices of the Church of Rome, whilst upon various most important points and leading features in that vast system of religious priestcraft, they are altogether in agreement with her. There's a previous question then to be determined before their repudiation of the charge can be of practical use. What is Romanism? If, as our Archbishop tells us, their doctrine on the rule of faith no. is the ground of all papistry, their verbal disclaimer of papistry is mere idle talk. But unfortunately to the ordinary reader, this equivocal use of terms throws the whole subject into ex inextricable confusion. It is very hard, he will say, that those should be accused of holding Romish doctrines who have expressly repudiated and even abused Romanism. And is it not more desirable that we should hold Catholic doctrines and the ancient religion? On these points, however, this is not the place to enlarge as they will more properly come under our consideration in a subsequent page. With these facts and statements before his eye, the reader will not be surprised to learn that the Romanists are loudly hailing the efforts of the tractators as directly tending to the reestablishment of their doctrines as the doctrines of the Anglican Church. We may depend, says Dr. Wiseman, upon a willing and able and a most zealous cooperation on the part of the tractators with any effort which we may make towards bringing her, the Anglican Church, into her rightful position in Catholic unity. 
So he's saying the tractators would certainly stand by that. In other words, with the Roman Catholic Church, and among other proofs of the truth of this, he remarks, it seems to me impossible to read the works of the Oxford divines, and especially to follow them chronologically, without discovering a daily approach of our holy church, both in doctrine and affectionate feeling. Our saints, our popes, have become dear to them by little and little. Our rites and ceremonies, our offices, nay, our very rubrics, are precious in their eyes. Far, alas, beyond what many of us consider them, our monastic institutions, our charitable and educational provisions, have become more and more objects with them of earnest study and everything in fine that concerns our religion deeply interests their attention. Their admiration of our institutions and practices and their regrets at having lost them manifestly spring from the value which they set upon everything Catholic. Dispose them without any sincerity which they have given us no right to charge them with to love the parts of the system and wish for, or they would reject the root and only secure support of them, is to my mind revolting contradictory. Further proof of the view which I present is this, he's quoting, that general dissatisfaction at the same system of the Anglican church is clearly expressed in the works of these authors it is not a blame cast on one article or another. <clears throat> it is not blemish found in one practice or a Catholic want in the second or a Protestant redundancy in the third. But there is an impatient sickness of the whole. It is a weariness of a man who carries a burden it is not of any individual stick of his faggot of which he complains. It is the bundle which tires and worries him. The Protestant spirit of the articles in the aggregate and their ins unsupportable un-Catholicism in specific points, the loss of ordinances, sacraments, and liturgical rites, the extinction of the monastic and ascetic feeling and observances, the decay of awe, mystery, tenderness, reverence, devotedness, and other feelings which may be especially called Catholic, the miserable feeling of solitariness and separation above described. There are but a portion of the grievances whereof we meet complaints at every turn the removal of which would involve so thorough a change in the essential condition of the Anglican Church, as these writers must feel would bring her within the sphere of attraction of an all-absorbing unity and could not long withhold from her the embrace of its center. Still, at pages 16 and 17, he's quoting... Still further proof is justly found in the statements of Mr. Ward, who deeply regrets our church's present corruption and degradation. Here's with pain the words pure and apostolical applied to her, thinks that the mark of being Christ's kingdom is obscured and but faintly traced on the English church, and speaks of those sisters in other lands from whom she has been so long and so fatally dissevered, and of her restoration to active communion with the rest of Christendom, in terms the meaning of which cannot be understood. As might be expected, the endeavor to pervert our articles to a tridentine sense is eagerly caught at as smoothing the way to a full and complete return to popery. A still more promising circumstance, he says, I think your lordship will, with me, will consider the plan which the uneventful Track 90 has pursued and in which Mr. Ward, Mr. Oakley, and even Dr. Pusey have agreed. 
I allude to the method of bringing their doctrines in accordance with ours by explanation. A foreign priest has pointed out to us a valuable document for our consideration. Bousset's reply to the Pope when consulted on the best method of reconciling the followers of the Augsburg Confession with the Holy See. The learned bishop observes that providence had allowed so much Catholic truth to be preserved in that confession that full advantage should be taken of the circumstance that no retraction should be demanded but an explanation of the confession in accordance with the Catholic doctrines. Now for such a method as this, this way is in part prepared by the demonstration that such interpretation may be given of the most difficult articles as will strip them of all contradictions to the decrees of the Tridentine Synod. This instructive passage the reader will do well to ponder. <clears throat> Notwithstanding the Protestant spirit of the articles in the aggregate and their un insupportable un-Catholicism in specific points, the magic wand of an explanation will strip them of all contradiction to the decrees of the Tridentine Synod and the statements for which Rome has so often made thousands pay the penalty with their blood are now found to be found nothing more than that which is easily reconcilable with the statements of Trent itself. It may be known to many <clears throat> that a very similar attempt to reconcile our articles with the doctrines of the Romish church was made two centuries ago by an English convert to popery named Christopher Davenport but who's better known by his Romish name of Francis Santa Clara. The work entitled Deus Natura Gratia and was written <clears throat> for the purpose of explaining many of the most important of the 39 articles so as make them conformable to the Tridentine statements. And he adds at the end a paraphrastic exposition of the rest of them proceeding upon the same principles wherein he maintains that they need only a befitting gloss to reconcile them to good popery. And for learning and ingenuity, our modern reconciler is not to be compared to him. But in all remarkable important points, the similarity between the two is remarkable. Thus, when it is said in Article 11 that we are justified by faith only, here saith Mr. Newman, faith as being the beginning of a perfect or justifying righteousness is taken for what it tends towards or ultimately will be. Well, this is going to be an interesting study in a day when theology and doctrine does not matter. Verse 2 of hymn 364. To thee all angels cry aloud, to thee the powers on high, all cherubim and seraphim continually to cry. Let us pray. Blessing and honor, glory and power, the end of the Lamb that sitteth upon the throne, for and ever and ever. Amen. Godspeed. Mm -hmm.